Hey, everybody. So um, I thought I'd come on and talk about a topic that probably comes up almost daily in people that I hear from in via email or in conversations. And I talked about it at one point in an earlier post back in, I think, March. Somewhere along the way I talked about it. But I thought I'd circle back because it's something that I think I just am in so many different conversations, text-wise, email-wise, um, and with friends that I've met in this that um, that are struggling and grappling with the idea of being in a relationship um, while being in Benzo with and going through this. And, and you know, the, the argument of kind of is it easier to be married or be partnered going through this or is it easier being by yourself? And... I don't think it's, I don't think there's a formula for that either, just like there isn't for anything else. But I think it's a topic worth speaking about because probably the majority of people that I speak to are in a relationship of some sort um, and, and are grappling with how to be in that relationship on a lot of different levels. And um, and so I think it's something that we can all talk about. And, and there's definitely certainly several people that have talked to me about just the loneliness of going through this completely alone and not having um, a husband or a wife or a partner to, to, to kind of navigate this with. So maybe we can, again, I guess we can't have a conversation. It's kind of one-sided, but I'll just kind of talk through some of the points that I think have come up in my conversations with folks and things that I think can be really challenging in this. And again, I think it's really up to that particular couple whether they're going to navigate benzo withdrawal probably well or really struggle. And then I think couples that are even really strong, I don't think it says much about the couple. I think it can be really, really challenging to have somebody who has a chronic, um, I shouldn't say chronic, I'm going to say long-term because to me chronic kind of implies forever and this is not a forever and it's not terminal but it's long term and you know for many years of my career I worked in hospice but I also worked in grief and loss so I did lots and lots of work with with families and couples where the husband or the wife or the partner had um, various cancers different types of diagnoses MS different things that were some were terminal but a lot of them were just very kind of long, drawn-out processes. And I got to watch firsthand the wear and tear that happens on a relationship going through that. And and I think this is not unlike that. Um, where I think this gets a little bit more complicated, if you are in a relationship, is that you know if, if you have cancer, there are cancer support groups, right? If you have Alzheimer, if your partner has Alzheimer's, there's Alzheimer's support groups, Um for for different things, there's you know there there are more resources out there, um, but for a lot of invisible illnesses, you know if, if if you know if you've got somebody who's dealing with certain autoimmune difficulties, there's you know they kind of fall in the same camp that we do, which is not a lot of support and a lot of kind of gaslighting, and our partners and our and can grow very weary in that process. So my thought is in terms of being in a relationship, what I've heard from people in terms of the cons, you know, the, the, the why it's harder in some ways, um, is the expectations, right? That we're not the partner that we once were. Um, even if that's as simple as we can't sit and watch TV with them because it's too stimulating. We, we, we aren't going to sit and dance with them in the kitchen to an old song because it's overwhelming, we're not going to go out to the movies or go out to dinner with friends. We're not going to go, you know, to happy hour or grab a drink after work together. Um, and so a lot of these kind of things that we probably did without thinking much about them, like going to a movie, like grabbing a happy hour drink after work, like, you know, dancing to our favorite song in the kitchen, um, you know, just watching TV at night, being able to sit and turn on you know, the news and or a movie or a, or a Netflix show and binge watch. You know, we're str- we struggle a lot of times with this. So very simple things, these expectations shift pretty quickly. And with that can come a lot of disappointment um, in ourselves, 
maybe even disappointment in them for, for them maybe getting frustrated or missing us or not understanding that we wish we could do those things, but we just can't um, because we're made of toothpicks and bubble gum at this point. Um, so the expectations and the disappointment can be really hard for us and for them because all that changes and there's no, there's no rule book. There's no guidebook, um, you know, and, and again, that the, the, the length of time this injury can take is maddening. And, and again, if we had something, you know, that was a little bit more well documented and, you know, like, like a cancer. And believe me, I'm not wishing that I had cancer. I'm just saying that for our partners, for our spouses, for our loved ones, it, there's been identified and identifiable factors researched and looked at and written about extensively and groups um, built around those things. And we just don't have that. Um, we have this kind of unknown quantity of time in front of us with these you know, this potpourri of random symptoms that, you know, again, don't make any sense emotionally, mentally, or physically. So it, the confusion and the disappointment of the expectations, I think, can be really hard. I think something else I hear a lot of people talk about is just this added layer of disconnect. We already feel so disconnected from ourselves. And now here walks in our husband, wife, partner, and we have this level of disconnect with them that, again, can often bring up shame and guilt. Um you know, that, that we wish that we felt more, we wish we could show more, we could wish we could be more expressive. Um, and, you know, a lot of times there's also a kind of a pressure to get back to who we once were. We can see it in their eyes, we're falling short. We can see it in their eyes. It's painful for our loved ones to watch us in pain. And it's painful for us to watch that reflected back in them, right? That they can see, you know, either how bad we're hurting or they can be really frustrated with they don't get it. You seemed fine yesterday. Why can't you get off the couch today? You were able to go, you know, do this thing with me last weekend. Now we're back to you not leaving the bed. It, it's incredibly frustrating and it's incredibly hard for us to see that frustration in them. Um, and then I think also, you know, obviously intimacy and sex. And I can't, we can't take those things off the table either. And I have lots of people talk to me about this in terms of on lots of different levels, um, in terms of how difficult that part is, how much they feel like they're letting their partner down, but how they cannot conceive of the idea of being intimate or having sex. And I had talked about this in a different video where I kind of likened it to having a picnic in a tornado, right? Like, we don't feel safe in our bodies. We don't feel coherent or whole in ourselves. We're not in that rest and relax state where we've got oxytocin flowing and, and everything kind of working for us to move into that, as a friend called it, procreate and recreate. You know, we're not in a recreate and procreate uh, mindset. Um, you can't be in that state of rest and relax, rest and digest, recreate and procreate when you feel like you're trying to survive. You know, and that's, again, that, the idea of the picnic and the hurricane or that example I always talk about being in a riptide and you're working hard to keep your head above the water. You're not looking at the shore and thinking, wow, that guy looks hot in his swimsuit. That's like the furthest thing from your mind, Right. Now, if you were non-injured and you were on the beach and you were, you know, enjoying the sun and the warmth and you were kind of in all of your senses, you might notice a guy or a girl and think, wow, they look hot or, oh, wow, my husband, my wife, my partner looks good today or, yeah, but, but when you're in a riptide and again, your head's popping up, you are not thinking that person looks amazing in their swim trunks. <laughs> you are not, it's just, you know, it's, it's like hierarchy of needs, right? We're trying to survive here. So I think there's a lot of struggle that people go through in anything from, I can't sit and watch TV or have dinner with my partner. I don't, I can't have the same level of conversation. I can't run off and watch a movie and grab a drink with them. Um, I can't go to friends' houses and, and and just I just had somebody reach out to me earlier and say, you know, they'd been at like a community party 
because they were feeling a little bit better and they ate chicken while they were out at this party and got sick and then found out the chicken had been made with wine. And, you know, it, it, it gets crazy, right? Like how many things feel off limits to us out of kind of needing to protect ourselves. Um, I think the, in, in terms of, in terms of other things about relationships that can be hard for them and for us, again, is how easily overwhelmed we are, right? Um, and I guess I could say another thing about just kind of sex, the sexual aspect of it is, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I feel very regressed in this. Like I feel like a scared little kid in this. And I've had many people tell me they feel the same thing. They feel like, what's that show called? That reality TV show, Naked and Afraid, whatever it is. Like I feel that level of vulnerability, right? So again, that level of vulnerability does not equate to a sense of intimacy with anybody, right? It, it, it's hard for me to even have phone calls with people sometimes about just random things, let alone, you know, be able to kind of contemplate or imagine, you know, being relaxed enough in my own sense of myself and to feel, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I mean, I haven't given this much thought till I'm talking about it right now. But if I feel like a regressed five-year-old in this a lot of the time and just like walking through the world with big eyes and scared and everything's a grizzly bear and, you know, I don't know, but, you know, having the idea of having an intimate relationship or a sexual relationship when you're five or eight is repulsive, at least to me. So, you know, I think, again, as we go through this and we feel so insecure and we feel so unsafe and unsteadied, um, you know, I think the idea would be, wow, it, it, it would feel good to be held. I think, I think that is true. And I think that can be a pro for some people. Some people will say it's helpful to be held by my partner in this physically. It's, it's, it's helpful that they rub my head or it's helpful that they help. But, but a lot of times, you know, again, you know, everybody's very different, right? So each couple's very different. And, you know, we're not on level playing fields, okay? This doesn't mean that all of our partners are our caretakers necessarily, but it does mean that they're, you know, that that, 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 the, the, the tables aren't even at this point. And I remember growing up and my mom and dad, you know, been, they've been married now for, I think, 56 years. Um, but years ago, you know, I was talking to them and they said that the secret to a long marriage was that you both can't be down at the same time. And I think that's true. And I think it's been a, a big part of their success in marriage. But I think what happens for us is we're down for so long <laughs> that by default, at some point while we're down, most likely our partner's going to go down too. Whether it's out of disappointment, exhaustion, depletion because of us, whether it's out of something in their life is going on, whatever it is. So even the the best of circumstances with the best of partners and husbands and wives, we could really run into a situation where we're both done at the same time, just because, again, the nature of this is that for many of us, we're in this so long. You know, it's not like we have the flu and, oh, it's good. Let's hope that we both don't get the flu or COVID at the same time. Okay. No, we're talking about something that could go on months or years. So obviously the pros to being in a relationship would obviously not feeling so alone you have a true partner in this, somebody who's seeking to understand. I've met plenty of people who are doing research for their loved ones. They're on the groups actually for their husband, wife, or partner um, and doing that work. And that's amazing. Um, but again, you know, I've also met many people whose marriages fell apart as a result of this. Um, they just, it just, they couldn't, they couldn't stand the, the stress and the strain of it. And so, um, you know, I think there's that piece um, that, that, that is, becomes a part of the story for many people. So when it comes to relationships in this, I just think we have to take it like we take every other symptom or aspect of benzo withdrawal was that it's so idiosyncratic. It's so dependent upon you, your, who you are in that relationship, who, that, who your partner is in that relationship to, um, sorry if you hear my dog drinking in the background, um, but we have to kind of recognize that again, that, you know, many people might say, 
I couldn't have done this without my partner. And that's amazing. And thank God, right, for those situations. And then I've met many people that have said, I'm really happy I, I'm i not in a relationship going through this because I don't think I could handle the feeling of letting somebody down, the feeling of the, watching the disappointment in their face, the feeling of watching them be so confused and conflicted, um, the feeling of, of that I'm letting everybody down. And then, you know, I think that, that, there's also the navigating that we have to go through when we're in relationships when this happens and how, who's there to help us. You know, I think, I think you know, m- one of my dreams when I come out of this and heal is really going to be about providing couples and family support to people that are going through this because, you know, you don't just need couples therapy in this. You need a specific type of couples therapy in this because this isn't just about how do we have deal with conflict? How do we deal with money and sex? How do we deal with, you know, the big hot issues that are common in relationships? This is about how do I how do we renegotiate our expectations of each other and how do we create a new narrative while we're both going through this? And so again, I don't really have answers to this. I wanted to just kind of bring it up in terms of I know it, it's on a lot of people's minds. And I think people that aren't in a relationship wish they were. I think a lot of times people that are in relationships are wishing they could almost push a pause button and, you know, just let everything be on hold, freeze frame until they could heal and come back to their partner, their husband, their wife, their family, um, because they don't want this, the trauma of this to to take root um, in the relationship. So again, I, I think it's a complicated, complex, as everything in this is, um, and very idiosyncratic kind of phenomenon. But, but know that regardless of whether you're going through this alone or whether you're going through this with somebody, both have their challenges and probably both also have their advantages. Um, but again, I think really what's needed, and I, I do hope to fill this gap at one point because I, I really loved doing couples therapy when I was a therapist. And I just think in this, both couples and family therapy is so needed because it's very specific to not only being in a long-term illness, injury, but being in one that's so up and down, non-linear, you know, it, it's got the professionals, well, I, should, I was going to say it's got the professionals confused. I don't know that it's got them interested enough to be confused, but it's certainly not, there's no guidebook, there's no real understanding of how to help a couple navigate such a complex situation. And because benzo withdrawal hits us on an emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, biological level, like there's really no stone unturned. And I think that's true for our partners and and our people in this as well. And so there has to be, you know, some room for that. So again, no real answers here, just ponderings, but certainly something to be aware of that, again, if you're in a relationship and, and thinking, gosh, this is so hard, um, it may be, it'd be easier out of a relationship. Or if you're you know single and you're thinking, God, it'd be easier to have somebody. Again, I think there's advantages and disadvantages on both sides because it's very complicated. Relationships are vulnerable and complicated to begin with uh, if you don't throw a stressor like this on top. So... Um, if you have questions or thoughts about this, I'd love to hear from you via, via email. Um, I think I, most of you know how to get a hold of me by email, but it's uh, jenniferswanphd at gmail.com. Again, jenniferswanphd at gmail.com. So it's just my YouTube name plus at gmail. Um, you're welcome to email me. I'd love to hear from you. And, and then I, you know, depending on what I learn and what people are talking about, I'm happy to come back on and and talk about this a little bit further, but it's definitely on my mind also just kind of given my background because it was my very favorite thing to do in my work was to do couples therapy. I loved my individual work too and some family stuff, but my couples work just really loved it. And I can absolutely see how this would be so incredibly challenging for so many people going through this either wanting to be in a relationship, wondering if they're ever going to be able to be in one again, or trying to salvage the relationship and remain intact with the one that they're, that one that they're in going through this. So thanks for listening, guys, and um, I'll check back in with you soon.